Can I just ask anybody here who did love running, picked up any, anyone injured from doing that? I, I was. I've got a bad back ever since I've done it. I'm going to sue Philip Gennardi. <laughs> okay. Anyway, only joking, only joking. Um, well, it's lovely to be with you tonight, and to be honest, we didn't organise the Jubilee celebration. That, that was organised by, by the people, but, but it, Jubilee's God's idea, isn't it? Starting again, celebration. Um, so we, it's been great to, to honour the Queen, and, and we do want to pray for our country. It, it has such need, and, and it's wonderful to be part of a, of a church, a church community in the city that really wants to see Britain change and Bristol change. And it's going to change because we're disciples. It's going to be changed not so much by the large numbers of people who have an adherence to Christianity, but by the numbers of people who are passionate disciples. And there's something about discipleship which raises the bar for all of us who want to follow Jesus. It seems to me when I look at the life of Jesus that there is grace for everyone and blessing for everyone. Jesus would go into a village and heal all their sick. 5,000 people show up and they all get fed. And that's the way that Jesus was. His blessings were for everyone. But for discipleship, there was a different bar. There was a bar that was to do with following at a cost. Remember the words of Jesus to the rich young ruler who wanted to come after him and Jesus said, unless you sell all your possessions and, 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 and give to the poor, then you can't come and follow me. That's what I want you to do. That's raising the bar big time, isn't it? And we're going to reflect on some of the words of Jesus. But I think that's one of the challenges that we have in our Christian culture, that we are in a blessing culture rather than a discipleship culture. And because we know that God is good and that he loves us, and because we've seen Jesus as a loving minister, then we approach him wanting to be blessed. And wanting, if you like, to get our rights, rather than approaching him as those early disciples did, because they've been called to something truly radical and searching that's going to cost them everything. I mean, just how many of us have ever been offended with God? Because some, for some reason, we feel he's not looked after us in the way that we thought he should. Okay, I saw one or two hands there. And those are just the brave ones, you know? But when, when I think that question, offended with God, because somehow we feel that God has not dealt justly with us. He's not kept his side of the bargain. It's probably those sort of feelings that we've had. And I want to unpack some of those things as we look at discipleship tonight. But we'll start by reading some scripture. And I'm reading from... Matthew's Gospel, chapter 10, verse 32. Well, I'll go back a bit. I'll go back to verse 24 and then skip around a little bit. Like this. Anyway, um, a student is not above his teacher, nor a servant above his master. It's enough for the student to be like his teacher and the servant like his master. And if the head of the house has been called Beelzebub, how much more than members of his household. So don't be afraid of them. Don't be afraid of those who kill the body, but cannot kill the soul. It goes on to say, whoever acknowledges me before men, I will also acknowledge him before my Father in heaven. But whoever disowns me before men, I'll disown him before my Father in heaven. Do not suppose I've come to bring peace to the earth, I didn't come to bring peace, but a sword, for I have come to turn a man against his father, a daughter against her mother, a daughter-in-law against her mother-in-law, a man's enemies will be members of his own household. Anyone who loves his father or mother more than me is not worthy of me. Anyone who loves his son or daughter more than me is not worthy of me. Anyone who does not take his cross and follow me is not worthy of me. Whoever finds his life will lose it. And whoever loses his life for my sake will find it. Those are very, very strong words. The words about discipleship. And a disciple is an apprentice, 
someone who is a student wanting to be like their teacher. A disciple is a little Christ. That's what a Christian is, a little Christ, someone who's imitating Christ. And when we think about Jesus and the sort of life that he lives, one of the things that's absolutely true about Jesus is that the trajectory of his life was one that was going to the cross. And that for Jesus, he knew that he was going to die. And he warns those who are his followers, if you're going to come with me, are you willing to go where I'm going? Do you remember when James and John asked him some questions? He said, can I sit at your right hand and your left hand? And he asked them a question. Are you willing to be baptized with the baptism that I'm going to be baptized with? Are you able to be? He was speaking to them about his suffering, actually. Speaking to, him about, to them about his death. Big words from Jesus. If you want to follow me, be prepared to die. And that is not our typical message. You know, if you're here tonight and you're investigating Christianity, that might not be the message that you want to hear, that you're expecting to hear. For those of you who, who are Christians, maybe you're thinking, actually, is that what I signed up for? Did I sign up to lose my life? And I suppose we, we have to unpack a little bit about what it means. Does Jesus literally mean, when he says, take up our cross, that we, we might be losing our lives? Well, there's certainly an element of that. When he says, don't be afraid of those who can kill the body, I guess Jesus had in mind the times that he was living in and the destiny of those very people who were following him. We know that of the 11 that survived, you know, leaving Judas aside, you know, the, of the 11, only John, as far as we know, died of old age. That the other 10 all lost their lives as martyrs. And we know that martyrdom was the seed of the early church. So there's a very literal sense, take up your cross and follow me. Jesus knowing this is where, this is the, the, this is the confrontation we're going into. And if you follow me, we're heading into trouble. And I think for many of us, we've seen the church as an ark that gets us out of trouble. A place to be safe, a place we can go and hide in, a place that where the world may be falling apart outside, here we can find an order and a peace and a caring and a sharing and a love and all that kind of stuff that makes us feel safe in a dangerous world. And in a way, it's not inappropriate to find refuge with the people of God. But it's in order that we might together go out into a world that is in need of the gospel and be sent out rather than stay in. And disciples are missionaries. Disciples are sent people. Disciples are people who, who are God's salt in a world that needs to be salted who are God's light in a world that needs to be lit. And discipleship is a place of risk, and a place of challenge, and a place that is not meant to be a safe place at all. Now, when Jesus says, take up your cross and follow me, there's some context here, isn't there? Anyone who loves his father or mother more than me is not worthy of me. Anyone who loves his son or daughter more than me, is not worthy of me. Anyone who doesn't take his cross and follow me is not worthy of me. It's about where my ultimate loyalty lies. And Jesus does not intend for us to read this and think, okay, I don't need to care about my family. I don't need to love them. It's really about the priority, the ultimate loyalties of our lives. And the message of Jesus really is, is that if we get the ultimate things right, then everything else follows that if we do love God with all our heart, soul, and mind and strength, then we will love our neighbor and our mother and father and sister and brother and son and daughter better than before. And Jesus, who demonstrates what it means to go to the cross and give up his life, also demonstrates what it is to love his mother. For those of you who were around at Easter, we, we heard Pam give a dramatic monologue written by Jonathan Burnside from the perspective of Mary, the mother of Jesus. And it's a wonderful thing. It's probably available online even now, if you, if, and I would recommend it as a, as a listen. 
But there was something in that monologue which portrayed this truth. Here's Mary talking about the care of Jesus for her and the provision of Jesus of a son in John for her. But it's because, first of all, he's loving God and laying down his life. But the flow of care follows from that. So that's, you understand all that, don't you? You know that Jesus isn't telling us literally to hate our family. Rather, it's just to say, so much more do we prefer God. So much of claim of loyalty does he have that it would look uh, in the light of that as if we hated them. But in fact, when we love God, we love them more than even if we were making them our first love. Because the problem about loving things, anything other than loving God first, is the thing that we love becomes an idol. And then we cease to love it in a whole way. And it can become distorted. I'm getting technical. When Jesus tells us to die, his message is certainly followed up by Paul. And Paul talks a lot about dying, about death. And of course, Paul himself is someone who pours out his life unto death. And we know that Paul himself was was martyred. So when he talks about death, though he's talking metaphorically, he's actually somebody who is a true disciple and someone we can really learn from. And it seems to me that, that Paul, when he talks about dying as a disciple of Jesus, talks about three things, really. He talks about dying to sin. He talks about dying to the flesh. And he talks about dying to our rights. And those are good things for us to be thinking about. And in Romans chapter 6, um, Paul talks about this whole business about being dead to sin. And again, I might just read a little bit from there if I can. What should we say then? Shall we go on sinning so that grace may increase? You see, he's addressing that bless me culture. He's saying, look, we know that God is good and loving and merciful, so it's okay to sin, perhaps, because that just means that God blesses more and forgives more. That's a wonderful thing. He says, no, of course that's not meant to be like that. We died to sin. How can we live in it any longer? We were buried with him through baptism into death in order that just as Christ was raised from the dead through the glory of the Father, we too may live a new life. Dying to sin is, at one level, good news. It's kind of saying it's possible for sin not to rule over us anymore because it's dead. Once it's dead, it's lost its power. Now, the challenge for us we won't say, That's, that sounds great. Wouldn't it be great if the things that used to have power in my life, the sinful things that I used to do, I no longer do. And I'm not even tempted to do them because it's dead. The challenge is, it's not as simple as that, is it? You know those fairy stories which um, talk about the kind of prince kind of killing the, the dragon and chopping its head off, and then another head grows and it's to chop it off again. Sin's a little bit like that, actually, isn't it? When we die to sin, the the irritating thing about sin is that we seem to keep generating the stuff. Have you you had that experience? And I think what Paul is saying to us when, when we say we're dead to sin is that we have to be very ruthless with the things that we know we have to die to. And we have to die to stuff by constantly putting it to death. And so there's a habit of dying that's part of our life. Every day we die. It could be, to be practical, here's a sin, unforgiveness. Has anyone ever experienced unforgiveness? And has anybody who's put their hands up ever forgiven the person that they felt unforgiveness to? And they've done it, and they've been genuine, they've gone to God, and they've felt the, the relief And then, a little bit later on, they find that unforgiveness has returned. It's not that you weren't genuine when you asked for forgiveness and and wanted to forgive that person. In that now moment, you generally had died to that, to, to the right that you had to hold on to unforgiveness. 
and you let them go and you experience peace. But the next day, when you saw them again, when you remembered that thing, or when they behaved in just the same way that you'd already forgiven them for, it, the same issue came alive again in your life. And so rather than thinking, oh, it doesn't work, you say, I'm going to be ruthless with that. I'm going to kill that thing off. Mm. If you're a gardener, you have to be like that with things in your garden, don't you? Like bindweed. Isn't bindweed horrible stuff? You know? And you tear it off the plants and, you know, you've got to burn it. You can't put it on the compost. It's, you've got to dig it out and get rid of it and you have to work hard to kill it. And the stuff in our life, we have to work hard to kill sometimes. We can't kill it by ourselves. We need God's help. But we need to cooperate with him. Die to sin. Sometimes the challenge is that the thing that we have to die to is something that we actually don't want to die to. It's quite nice. It might, un unforgiveness or, there are some things which, they're very black and white, but th some things are more subtle. You know, it might be an affair, an infatuation. You have to die to that, and you generally die to it, but you have to die to that the next day as well. But being ruthless with things that, that are dead keeps things that are dead, dead. And a disciple is somebody who's been willing to be ruthless with things that need to die. Okay. Second thing, then, that we might need to die to, the flesh. Let's just have a look at Colossians chapter 2. He does talk a lot about death. He says, since you died, Paul says in, in Colossians 2, to the basic prince of this world, why, do you, why is there you still belong to it? Do you submit to its rules? Do not handle, do not taste, do not touch. These are all destined to perish with us. They're based on human commandments and teachings. And then he goes on to say, since you've been raised with Christ, set your heart on things above where Christ is seated at the right hand of God. Set your heart on things above, not on earthly things. For you died and your life is now hidden with Christ in God. When Christ, who is your life, appears, then you also will appear with him in glory. Put to death, therefore, whatever belongs to your earthly nature. And he gives a long list of things. Sexual impurity, lust, evil, desires, greed, which is idolatry. Because of these things, the wrath of God is coming on those who are disobedient. You used to walk in these ways in your life. But now, you must rid yourself of all such things. Anger, rage, malice, slander, filthy language from your lips. Don't lie to each other. Since you've taken off your old self with its practices and have put on the new self which is being renewed in the knowledge of the image of the creator. Therefore, as God's chosen people, holy and dearly loved, clothe yourselves with compassion, kindness, humility, gentleness and patience. Bear with one another, forgive whatever grievance you have, forgive as the Lord forgave you over all these virtues, put on love which binds them all together in perfect unity. It's talking about, Paul's talking there about behavior that comes from having a nature, a flesh life, which is basically not submitted to God. I think the picture that Paul has of us is that before we make Jesus Lord, we have this kind of humanity nature, which is basically Co cooperating with spiritual powers that are in rebellion to God, powers of evil, powers of Satan, and that we, we form habits and behaviors that are actually in antipathy to what God originally made us to be. And that our, our very nature itself, the things we find in ourselves, it's not like kind of conscious acts of sin, but just the stuff, just the way we are, is something that has to die. You know, John Wimber used to say, you know, are you trying to heal the old man or live out the new one? Isn't it better just to die to the old man and live out of a new one? And sometimes we are trying to heal an old nature. We're not being radical enough with it. Say, so actually, the whole thing needs to die. Christianity isn't a bolt-on, a bit of a bolt-on doctrine, a bit of a bolt-on practice here. It's a root and branch, death, resurrection thing, which is why baptism is the key sign of discipleship. Because it's about saying, this old person isn't good enough. It's got to die. I've got a friend, a friend of Michael Keith, who's a songwriter. When he was about 18 or 19, we were in a band together, and he wrote this song called It's Not Enough to Be Nice. And it had this kind of line, that, you know, you've got to start again, start again, not better people, but new men. 
You've got to change your mind. It might be cruel, it'll certainly be kind. You know you've tried to be good most of your life. It doesn't cut any ice. It's not enough to be nice. It's about being new. And so we've got to say, this nature that I have, this actually has got to come under new ownership, new lordship. It's got to, it's got to be resurrected. We've got to taste resurrection in this life with our whole nature. And sometimes the problem that we have as, as followers of Jesus is that we've got new ideas but old practices. We've changed our thinking, but we haven't actually changed our behavior. And Paul, and actually Jesus, talked quite a lot about behavior and said there's some hallmark things that are going to look different. And you have to put off this behavior and put on the new stuff. And again, you, you know this. But we're not meant to live in a behavioral vacuum. It's, if you're trying not to be bad, <laughs> if you, if you, you know, you've, you've also got to put something in the place of the other stuff. And it's not like, oh, I'm going to stop hating. That's not good enough. It's a vacuum there. I, I'm going to start, stop hating and start loving. I've got to have new behavior to replace old behavior. And it's the flesh. And again, we cannot do this stuff without the help of the Holy Spirit. But we have to cooperate with the Holy Spirit to do this. I can't be good by myself, but I'm not being asked to be good by myself. This discipleship bar which Jesus gives us, which is a high bar, he doesn't say, okay, get on and do it, because that would be the sort of legalism that Paul's just addressed in the second chapter of Colossians, where he says, these regulations, they've got no power to restrain the sinful nature. Just law won't do it. But a spirit that cooperates with the Holy Spirit and invites the indwelling spirit to shape and guide can do it. But we have to cooperate with the spirit in a process of letting Jesus be Lord of our flesh life. And that means looking at the raw material of us and consciously giving it over to him, the whole thing. And I think it does mean consciously giving over the things that we're proud of and think we're okay in, as well as the things we're struggling with. It's, it's a root and branch thing. This whole thing has to be given to him, this flesh life. It's under new management. Jesus is Lord. And um, it's all right to practice on some behavior. Last, last week, I was at, at a conference uh, in Harrogate, which is a new wine conference, and there's a, a guy called Alan Hirsch speaking. Anyone read Alan Hirsch or heard of him at all? Uh, he's a Jewish South African who lived in Australia. He's now living in California. And um, he's a bright, bright guy, but he's, you know, he used to be an addict. His wife was a lesbian. He's sort of done a bit of life, <laughs> and he's done a little bit of, of mission. And he has got a friend called Mike Frost, and they had this kind of discipleship thing for young adults in, in Australia, which was based on the mnemonic bells. And basically, they, they, they tried to give people a rule of life, which would actually contribute to a changed way of thinking. Because as, as Alan says, what we do, we then rationalize. We think about what we do. It becomes part of our mindset. And um, this... The, the, the rule of life for these guys, it's just some behavior thing. Bells, it's not the letter B. First of all, bless. And in their community, the challenge is bless consciously as your minimum, this is all minimum requirements here, bless three people a week. One person from inside the church, one person outside the church, and you can choose the third person, whether in or out. Three times a week, consciously do something to bless somebody. Second one, L. Bells, second one is, is bells. E, eat. <laughs> eat with somebody inside the church once a week, someone outside the church once a week, and then the third time you choose, whether it's in or out. If you start to eat with people, you'll start to do mission, because they'll invite you back. You'll start to be hospitable. you open up your hand. Third one, L, listen. Contemplative prayer. Commit yourself to an hour a week listening to God maybe 10 minutes a day, whatever it is. Fourth L, fourth letter L, um, learn, read a gospel, read something from the gospel, read another book of the Bible, and read a book, but it's not allowed to be trash. It's part of a learning thing. And finally, S, sense, it stands for, 
for a follower of Jesus, reflect every week. How have I cooperated with the Spirit sending me? Or where have I been resisting the Spirit? And here's just some simple behavior that we can do that will start to do something with this flesh life that we live that will make a difference on our discipleship and actually on our thinking. Anyway, I'll leave that with you. So we, we want to die to us to sin, we want to die to the flesh, and we want to die to our rights. And this is perhaps the, the hardest one of all, because we can feel positive about dying to sin. But yeah, that would be good. It'd be great if I didn't sin anymore. We can, we can feel positive about dying to our flesh. We think, ah, oh, I've been struggling with who I am, and if I could be different, that's wonderful. But dying to our rights is tricky for us because we're a very rights-orientated culture. Perhaps uniquely so in the whole of human history. We have an incredible kind of um, list of human rights. We have, we would articulate things, our right to comfort, you know, our right to health, our right to financial security, our right to have a family, whatever our gender orientation, our right to marriage, our right to great sex, or whatever it is, we can think all this sort of stuff. If you're a human being in the 21st century, you've got a right to this, a right to good dentistry. That would be nice. <laughs> you know, we, 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 we perceive we have loads of rights. And if we do not get our rights met, we think we're entitled to misbehave. I'm not having great sex, therefore I've got a right to leave my partner. You know, I've, I've not got great health, then I've got a right to be annoyed with God. And I think that Christians behave like that. And we get offended with God. I don't think we have any right to offence. That is a right that we can hold on to. I've got the right to be offended because I was hurt. I was sinned against. Therefore, I've got the right to be offended. Where does it say that in the scripture? That we have got a right to be offended or to hold on to offence. Doesn't it say exactly the opposite? Unless you forgive someone, how can you be forgiven? Is, is the tenor of the words of Jesus. We've got no right to hold on to unforgiveness. And I think we, we do this really because we have this justice demand. You know, we, we have this kind of say, I want justice, and we're driven by that. But actually, if we look at justice, the scales are all in God's favor, aren't they? Let's have holy, perfect, loving creator God here, rebellious creature here, God giving his only son to lay down his life for us that we be free from sin and from the power of the devil here, and my rights to health and happiness here. How does it pan out? It seems to me that the only person with rights to health, wealth, security was Jesus. Because the deal is a cause and effect deal. All the way through scripture, we see very clearly, you know, actually, if you have pure hands and a clean heart, if you are sinless, you've got every right to the protection of God. Haven't you? And if you sin, you've got every right to judgment. That's, that's how the Bible is constituted, I think. So there's only one person who had the rights to health, wealth, and prosperity on the planet. That was Jesus Christ, as far as I can see. And in fact, not only do I think that, the devil thought that. So he thought, okay, Jesus, I can tempt you on your rights. Okay, you're hungry. Haven't you got the right to bread? In fact, if you turn these stones into bread, you know, just, or haven't you got the right for protection? You know, if you jump off the temple, won't God, as it says in Psalm 91, 
for someone who puts their trust in you, why don't you make sure that you don't cast your foot against the stone? Jesus had the rights. And it's Jesus who laid down the rights. So health, wealth, and prosperity, well, I, the health one, no, no record of Jesus being sick. But um, in terms of the wealth, you know, foxes have holes. Son of man's got nowhere to lay his head. In terms of safety, Psalm 91. You know, God will protect you. You won't see danger. Jesus knew that was his right. said to Pilate, you know, actually, I could call on 12 legions of angels right now for my safety. Jesus gave up his rights for us. And we who haven't got any rights are invited to give up our rights too, that we, can't, we don't actually have in the first place. But as followers of Jesus, we are people who are prepared to give up to our little rights. You know, the story that, that, that says it all is the story of the unforgiving servant, where this guy who owes his master billions of pounds is forgiven and let off, and then he encounters a servant who owes him a few bob and says, oh, I've got the right to have you put into prison, because you owe me. That's the scales. That's the scales of justice. And when we get mad at God, or anybody else, actually, we're like that unforgiven servant. Now, laying down our rights. In practice, laying down our rights, because we're followers of Jesus, usually means some degree of serving other human beings. Because you see, if God walked into the room tonight in some physical manifest form and said, people of Woodlands, <laughs> I want you tonight to sell everything you have, you know, and, and go to Saudi Arabia and preach the gospel. <laughs> you know, the imminent presence of God would probably think, oh, we let, you know, we'd, we'd be quick to do it, I think, probably. Perhaps we wouldn't, you know, we might be quaking in our boots, but we... The problem is we don't get that sort of revelation. What we get is some church leader saying, will you do this? Or some, you know, we get that, don't we? Now, the rubber hits the road. We, we do have to work this thing out in human relationships. The problem is that human relationships are not God. So I don't think there's any getting away from the fact that me laying down my rights means that I will choose to serve other human beings and not be offended with other human beings and to lay my will down around someone else's agenda quite often. What I have to do, though, is make sure that what I don't do is see that person as God because they're not God. They're an agent for God. I was talking with um, one of my housemates' mother uh, yesterday, and she was describing living in a Christian community in the early 1980s, and I live in Christian community, it's an interesting discussion. It might even be in the late 70s, it was a long time ago. But they're, they're, she was saying that they're in this very heavy situation, and the church leader didn't believe in you having days off. And they were sort of seven days a week serve away, and, and she just said, you know, yeah, I think it'd be good if we had a day off sometimes. Within an hour, the church leader was round to her house and rebuking her for her rebellious speech because it one day off a week and um, you could say well if we've laid down our rights well we serve all the time the thing is when we lay down our rights before God though we may be challenged to go to the cross God actually is not an abusive tyrannical Lord when Jesus talks about seeking first the kingdom of heaven and making that your number one priority, it's in the context of saying, little flock, little children, you know, why do you worry about what you're going to eat and drink, what you're going to wear? Doesn't your father look after the birds of the air and the clothes, the lilies of the field? And aren't you more precious than those? Don't you think he's going to look after your needs? If you seek him first, if we give up our rights, isn't God going to look after us? And it's not that we're manipulating God, but that's the nature of God. Jesus in John 14 talks about 
John 12, rather, talks about a laying down of our lives, a laying down of our rights. And um, he says this. Oh, there they are. Where are they? Where's my glasses gone? I normally, ah, there they are. I can normally keep them on top of my head. It's a great place. Jesus replied, the hour has come for the Son of Man to be glorified. I tell you the truth, unless a grain of wheat falls to the ground and dies, it remains only a single seed. But if it dies, it produces many seeds. The man who loves his life will lose it, while the man who hates his life in this world will keep it for eternal life. Whoever serves me must follow me, and where I am, my servant also will be. My Father will honour the one who serves me. The thing about um, laying down our life and following Jesus is that we can't keep our life anyway. And if we try and look after our rights, we will find that we lose them anyway. If we're willing to live without rights, what we find is that something flows out of that which is freedom and fruitfulness. My friend Angela, who's sitting over there somewhere, um, has started to try and live what she would call an undefended life, which is partly what I've been talking about tonight, really, about not having rights, not trying to defend, protect oneself. And what her experience has been is that it's been very joyful. And it's kind of sustained a loving intimacy with God, which has previously been a fluctuating thing. And that's the fruit of a life that's laid down for God. I remember talking to my friend, um, Matt Guttridge, about coming to Bristol with a vision to do his thing, to pursue a particular sense of calling and spiritual ambition, which seemed really good. And yet the call to lay it down and throw in his lot with us. And it was a really, to me, a really impressive and touching and unusual attitude. It's one that you'd hope to see in many Christians. But actually, it's kind of saying, because I'm following you, God, I'm willing to somehow subordinate myself to things that I see you doing with other people in this place. And it's not about my ambition. It's about you and your ambition and your will being done. And, and to feel some blessing and some fruitfulness and God doing some things with a life that's like that. If we're willing to let things die remarkable things will flow from that death. The uh, famous missionary guy who got killed, whose name I can't remember. Jim Elliot, exactly. I knew it, I knew it was him. He said, uh, didn't he, he said, uh, a man is no fool to lose what he cannot keep, to gain what he cannot earn. That's what laying down our lives is all about costly strong medicine but it heals the cell so I'm going to pray with you church and you know, we're, we're, we're doing this a series on this afternoon because we believe that's our number one challenge as a church community you know our, our mission statement at Wood is is See, unchurched people become committed followers of Jesus, disciple everyone. And discipleship is at the heart of it all. That's the command that Jesus gave us to make disciples. To people, this is wholehearted stuff. This is passionate stuff. This is crazy stuff. This is people who are willing to give up everything to follow Jesus. But it's only those sort of people that will really see the world changed. We will otherwise just be a bolt-on to a society that's going to hell, to a world that's falling apart. We will be evangelized by our culture. But if we're truly disciples, it doesn't take too many real disciples to change the world. Are you willing to be a true disciple? Are you willing to lay down your life, all of it, at the foot of Jesus? Are you willing to dethrone yourself as king and lord of your life and say, Jesus Christ is Lord? That's the challenge. That's going to be something that I need to pray 
And that needs to be part of my daily discipleship, my daily prayer, to say today, Lord, will you be Lord of me today? For me, lordship isn't a one-off issue. It's something I have to live in the ongoing reality. It's not a decision I made 30 years ago or whenever I did. It's a daily decision today. Jesus Christ is Lord. Pray with me if you feel you can. Father, you've given us a Lord in Jesus Christ who shows us the way of salvation, who shows us how to live, who is somehow whole in a broken world, who is somehow able to be in dark places and not defiled by them, who's able to walk the roads of this planet and the Satan has no hold on him and whose life has irrevocably changed the whole course of human history. And we hear, Lord God, his voice saying, come, follow me. Take up your cross and follow me. We hear him saying to us, I will make you fishers of men. We hear him say, you will be where I am. And we say, Lord God, take my life. Let it be consecrated, Lord, to thee. Take my silver and my gold. Nothing else will I withhold. Take my pride and my ambitions. Take my secret history, my secret life. Be Lord of my mind, my emotions, my body, my gifts, my weaknesses. Help me to live for you as you fill me with your spirit. Holy Spirit, will you come and bring that Lordship of Christ to bear on my life? Will you stimulate my conscience? Will you change my thinking? Will you change my behavior? Will you be Lord of it? Lord, where I've been holding on to things, possessive, even of things that are destructive and toxic in my life. Choose to lay those things down now at the cross. So follow, I follow you, Lord Jesus. Amen.